here's a very, very important and highly ignored set of concepts uh, that need to be overviewed concerning astrophysics. Astrophysicists ignore this, and it astounds me how many papers have nothing about this written in there, because this is probably one of the most important things when it comes to electrical and thermodynamic processes in the galaxy. Basically, every single star has these two processes involved. Now, these are the reverse of each other, or inverse, whichever, okay? So basically, they're the same process, but the only thing different about them is how they receive their heat, or how they receive their energy, okay? A Peltier cooler is a device used to make refrigerator air cold. It's very, very widely used. If you take apart one of those little refrigerators, one of those standalone refrigerators, you'll find that there's one single Peltier cooler about one inch by one inch. It's a little square thing, and it's coated with ceramic. That little thing keeps your entire refrigerator cold, depending on how much electric current goes through it. But anyways, here's what happens. You have two semiconductors, OK? There is your N block and your P block. P and N stand for the doping on that block. So say if it's silicon, P maybe could be zinc, and then N could be copper. I don't know. But very little bits of that doping is in there. For instance, if you have silicon over here, silicon over here, and then you dope this side with a little bit of copper, and you dope this side with a little bit of zinc. And that allows it to behave in the way we want it to behave. Meaning electrons leave, and positive charge leaves in this direction. But anyways, what happens is that the source of energy, say a battery or uh, some type of current, comes in, an uh, electrical source of energy, not heat, but electricity, comes through and causes these materials to eject their electrons and the positive charge, causing this side to cool and absorb heat from this side. So this side of the Peltier cooler where the ceramic is absorbed, or the ceramic is, will absorb heat. This is where the cool side is. And then it will dissipate the heat on this side. So basically, depending on how well these two materials can exchange charge and allow for a, a potential to show up, will determine how cold this can get and how hot this side will get. Because, you know, obviously, if you pull the heat from somewhere, the heat has to come out from some other place. So you have like this little wafer. Now, this is a little small diagram, but the wafer is really wide in this direction. But you can make material really cold on one side, and as long as you can dissipate the heat effectively, this side can get cooler and cooler. Now, there was a specific rule I remember my dad telling me about it. There was a change. So say, like, uh, if you have a 30 degree Celsius cold side, that means the hot side will be maybe 60. So that was a 30 degree jump change. Or if the cold side is, you can get it down to maybe like uh, zero degrees Celsius. Since it only has that 30 degree change, that means the hot side at its hottest will only get 30 degrees Celsius. So there was that rule. I have to, I have to look that up. Uh, of course, I have to study it more. In the reverse, if you'll notice, the source of energy on, on the Peltier cooler is electrical current. But the Seebeck effect is the inverse of that. The source of energy for that is heat. So something being hot. And given the same exact conditions, you have two semiconductors which are uh, doped differently. 
will allow electrical current to flow, and the dissipated heat on this side that is not converted to electrical potential or releases heat. And then you can apply a resistor to it, such as a small light bulb or LED. And depending on how much uh, semiconductor material there is and how much charge is flowing from the heat and how much heat there is, will determine how much electrical potential you can uh, give to that resistor, how much, how much uh, current can flow through that uh, resistor. So in other words, they're the same thing, only this one is taking heat as a source of energy, and this one is taking electric current as the source of energy. But it's the same exact, uh, everything else is exactly the same, basically. Now, I'm not going through a lot of the details of this, but you get their overall uh, pair of concepts. Now, the reason why this was important, I feel really bad for reason. I'm going to keep it up here forever. The reason why I mentioned this and why I mentioned that, why astrophysics ignores it is because if you have electrical current in outer space or if you have heat in outer space and semiconducting material, which obviously there's a lot of it, silicon is everywhere in outer space, it's, there's a whole bunch of it in the Earth's crust. I mean, come on. If you ignore both the transfer of heat into electrical current or the transfer of electrical current into heat, you're missing a whole bunch of the picture because what you have are objects that are radiating. Okay? Now, say for instance you have silicon in there or some type of semiconducting material or any kind of material that can transfer electrons easily, like plasma for instance. Now, given this entire thing is comprised of plasma, I do believe that electrical uh, current will be able to tra travel easily, but, you know, with some type of resistance. And say you have, okay, I'm going to go, I'm going to attack it from the, the Seebeck effect side of it, okay? Okay, so you have all this material, you have the, the material that can transfer electrical current, and you have heat. So what happens is, given wherever the heat is, and given the arrangements of two differing materials next to each other, will produce a set amount of heat given how, wherever that, uh, wherever those compounds are, wherever that material is. Now, I know it's kind of simplifying it in a way, because I don't think the Seebeck effect has a very very large effect concerning early star evolution. I think it really only takes place, say for instance, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scale up, so this isn't to scale, obviously. But say you have something like uh, Neptune. Now, when it starts forming its crust on the inside of the star, why exactly is all the material made of silicon? Is it maybe because the heat and electrical current is having some type of interplay in there, allowing it to build up very large amounts of silicon on the surface. Why is it silicon? Why is it aluminum? These two material materials are comprising the crust in large amounts. There has to be something in there concerning the Seebeck effect and the Peltier effect, which allowed the star to differentiate that specific material into its crust. And I haven't read in any geology book where that's mentioned, especially since we, we already know that silicon is a semiconductor. It's kind of strange how it's not mentioned in any geology book. And yes, I have taken this book, and I have read a whole bunch of it. I have read it and read it over and over again. And I can't find anywhere in here where it mentions silicon and its properties as a silicon or a semiconductor having anything to do with the fact that it's comprising a large percentage of the Earth's crust. Now, 
I have to tie into uh, later stages of stellar evolution where the star is you know, still hot, still radiating, and still differentiating in its interior and building that crust. But I just wanted to throw that out there for people because there's much more to the picture than what meets the eye. All right, today is June 20th, uh, 2015.